increasingly we're all conscious that we live in a time of unique uh, conflicts. Uh, partisanship has become a, a watchword uh, for our public uh, discourse. Uh, it's surely not new to our times. Uh, we need to be careful to suppose that there was a golden era when nobody argued with each other. Uh, but uh, there are unique uh, circumstances in which we do uh, learn how to argue with each other and uh, 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 make public uh, the conflicts uh, that are very much inside us and outside us. So when uh, the Apostle James writes, what causes fights and quarrels among you? I don't take it that he's only speaking uh, to the 21st century, but to that common human uh, dilemma called sin. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you, he writes. You desire but do not have, so you kill one another with words. Uh, uh, we're going to tackle this topic of conflict and reconciliation from a number of different angles, a pretty wide open uh, conversation. Uh, we have three of our beloved uh, professors uh, here to open up the conversation, uh, Professors uh, Singleton, Curry, uh, and Price. Uh, long pastoral experience uh, here at the table. Uh, they've not only sat, uh, if you will, or stood behind the podium, but also in the pulpit and uh, uh, wrestled with the questions of uh, conflict within communities of uh, faith and in the cultures in which those communities are situated. Uh, Professor Singleton is going to start us off. Uh, professor of Pastoral Ministry uh, teaches a good bit about conflict uh, resolution. Uh, has wrestled over a long time uh, in pastoral ministry about how congregations do or do not uh, wrestle uh, uh, well uh, with conflict. Uh, Professor Curry, uh, uh, the dean of our Doctor of Ministry program, uh, also addresses these issues uh, of pastoral identity and conflict resolution. And he reminds us uh, frequently, if you don't like uh, conflict, get out of ministry now, because that's uh, very much part of the fabric of, of life. Now, it seems to me uh, that could also be said about uh, any vocation uh, uh, as well, learning to deal with uh, conflict uh, inside of vocational identity is very much uh, critical. And Professor Price has uh, written and uh, speaks often not only about conflict within congregations uh, within the community of faith, but within the public square and how we wrestle with it uh, uh, in a civil uh, manner, but honestly and transparently. So with different voices, but uh, with common concerns, uh, each of these uh, uh, really in distinguished ways are going to raise this topic for us and then we'll, as we normally do, open up for questions and answers. Maybe a little conflict about conflict uh, afterwards, but uh, we'll set, uh, uh, see how that works. So first Professor Singleton, then Curry, and then Price. Well, thank you all for coming to lunch and coming to think about these kind of issues. I will put in a little plug for my colleague, Catherine Horvath, who's actually going to teach a whole course next fall on conflict. And so get ready to sign up to get the full load of hay from her. But we'll just give it a little start. And I wanted to talk specifically about really where conflict is coming from in local churches. We'll branch beyond local church before the time is over, but let me just give you a start to say that there is a lot of conflict in a church, and being a pastor of a church means you are involved sometimes in conflicts with yourself, sometimes in conflicts with other people in the church. There are lots of conflicts in Scripture, and when you begin to see them, you go, okay, this may be normal behavior uh, among Christians, you know, disciples get to wondering in various moments about who's the greatest, and they get in some conflict with each other about that. Paul and Peter in Galatia apparently are in such a conflict about who's sitting with whom at lunch that they actually go nose to nose. Paul and Barnabas have a well-known conflict uh, that occurs 
uh, because of a different view of whether or not to take John Mark with them on their next missionary journey. The Council of Jerusalem is trying to solve a conflict that comes out of the Jew-Gentile dilemma. So the scripture is not uh, hiding from us that people actually are really in conflict among the people of God around issues that are very important. I think in the church, there are five primary arenas in which conflicts occur, and I think it's helpful to try to differentiate between those so that we can know what's going on. Sometimes we have conflicts because personalities are clashing. Sometimes it's because of our unsanctified natures, that is our flesh is showing in some way. Sometimes our conflicts are really coming from unfinished business with the past, still struggling over relationships with father issues, mother issues, those get played out uh, in relation to pastors sometimes as people are not really understanding who they're mad at and they think it's you. Uh, it could be that they're mad at somebody else. Often it's that we never take the time to get our visions aligned. And that we thought we were going here and somebody else in the church thought we were going there and that that vision is not aligned. And very often it will be an issue around values and the values actually differ. And those values become so significant that we get in clashes about those. Very often, the three of us have certainly lived through the worship wars that occurred when Christendom and the organ and the robed choirs were giving way to guitars and drums and praise bands. In fact, I had the joy of being in such a conflict in my very first church that when I brought a guitar into the chancel on merely a Thanksgiving Eve service where I could instruct this very dignified congregation to sing the bluegrass song, I'll Fly Away. We had a banjo <laughs> in the chancel as well. Uh, the choir director actually resigned that night. <laughs> and the senior pastor called me and said that I had to call her first thing on Thanksgiving morning and apologize for my irreverent behavior, which she deemed as desecrating the sanctuary. So that was about a little values that were different. Uh, and I got to live through that one. And I lost a couple of my hairs on the top of my head over that one. So I think what we want to do is at least work hard in a local church to say, what's behind this conflict? And to grow with a bit of self-awareness. Because I want you to tell your neighbor right now, I want you to turn to him and say, you're going to be part of these conflicts. So would you tell him that right now? And so every time we get in these conflictual situations, especially if you're a Calvinist, you need to assume theologically that there's probably part of me that has contributed to this conflict, and very often we have. Uh, and that means to begin to have some empathy and think about what's going on in the life of that other person. So personality is going to let a lot of people get in conflicts just because we're different about different things we do, the introvert and the extrovert. Uh, I have a very different view of whether we should have a silent retreat in the church or not. Um, and that's going to be mostly a personality. It looks like it's a great theological issue, but as an extrovert, I can't sit still long enough to have a silent retreat. So we're not going to have any silent retreats until Dave Curry comes to work with me, and then we have to have a silent retreat. And so then that becomes difficult. Uh, when you make decisions, sometimes the person who is intuitive just feels what we need to do, and the sensing person needs data about what we're going to do. And those things get you in conflict. The J person, the judging person, is going to often see things in a very black and white way, and the P person, the perceiving person, sees things much more fluidly, and they don't need a script. And I used to like to steal the sermon manuscript of my young associate pastors right before they preached, thinking that if I stole their manuscript, it would stretch them to trust in God more. They didn't appreciate that. That was, that was really all about personality. Personality means that the cognitively undifferentiated person and the differentiated person, one likes black and white, the other prefers gray. 
That's a personality issue. And we have to learn to appreciate those kinds of things. A person's style and their pace, whether they're formal or informal, warm or cold, fast or slow, impulsive or deliberative. Those are very often part of the package we got at creation. And how can we learn to appreciate somebody else's way of being? So every now and then, in a kind of self-aware way, we need to be able to say, you know, I know that I'm a little more extroverted and that we may need to think about something from a different point of view. Or to be able to say, it must drive you nuts when I make decisions the way I make decisions. And Catherine Horvath will say, yes, it drives me nuts when you make decisions that way. So those are things we learn to do. Now, your unsanctified nature is different than your personality. These are things that have yet to grow. This is where pride is evident or self-centeredness has not been curtailed, where our anger is untamed, where our peace is missing and our anxiousness abounds, where the perfect love in Christ has not yet cast the fear out. Those are issues that we want to grow past. That's not personality. That's the flesh. That's the unsanctified nature. And that really causes a lot of conflict because the only people you have in churches are sinners. They're saved by grace, but they're still sinners. The process is not finished. They have not gotten where they need to get. Uh, none of us have. So that means every now and then we're just going to have to admit that's what's showing. Our blindness, our spiritual blindness is going to exacerbate the problem because we're going to think, oh, I think I've grown past that. I think my pride is all under control. I think my fear is cast out, and yet it's not. And somebody else can see it, and you might not be able to see it. A lot of us still have a lot of unfinished business from growing up. The process of differentiation from parents does not end at 18 when you go off to college. It's still there at 35 and somebody's upset because you're a father figure or a mother figure. A lot of people have had their trust issues broken and those have not been repaired. So they have a hard time trusting anybody, including you. They've let the sun go down on their anger and it's festered and it's boiled and it's become bitterness. The issues of abuse have lingered in their life and we haven't worked through those. We're not gonna get run over again by you, Pastor, because I was run over somewhere in my life and you're not gonna be able to do that with me. So a lot of that could fall into the unsanctified nature, but it's the specific kinds of issues of we just haven't received healing from those. And then visions, not being aligned. We really want to sacrifice for the poor. We really do want a new building. See, those might be two different visions that cause you to spend money in different ways. We really want to work for justice, but we've got some folks who want you to never talk about anything political in a church. Well, we might not be able to do that if justice involves systemic issues. We have congregations that have been instructed they're supposed to serve denominations. Denominations are really supposed to be serving congregations. That will often put you in conflict with your broader denominational networks because the visions are not aligned. And then finally, we have values that become different. And you're working that out even here. Are the values to get the best grades or the values to have family time? Ooh, that's a competing value sometimes. What is the meaning of money in a church? What is the meaning of money in your life? There are a lot of values that put us in major conflict, and I would say even some of the great ethical debates of today that are influencing life in the church, even like sexuality debates, often have a value underneath them that is driving the discussion to be more passionate than just about the facts. And so when we have the values engaged, our, our great discussions can get very animated in churches. And some churches have a value of truth and some have one of grace. And we theoretically have both of those as values. And yet we get in situations where somebody has fallen and do we protect the church or do we restore the person 
And that puts us in some values conflicts. So I'm going to stop at that point and simply say, those are the five arenas where I most often see conflict coming out of in a church and being able to pause in a non-threatened way and diagnose and realize, hmm, now what's going on here is going to aid the working through the conflict when my little red zone, as one writer calls it, gets ignited and I get all defensive about protecting me in the middle of this conflict, then I'm going to lose all perspective on what's triggering this conflict and how we might work through that. Somebody in a church is almost always mad at you. In fact, Lyle Schaller says, in the healthiest churches, 3% of the congregation is mad at you. Now, in a church of 100 people, that's just three and, you know, a couple of hit men, and you can be done with those three. Uh, I, in my last church, we had about 4,000 members, and that typically meant that there were about 120 people mad at me on a good day. And so that's just a little hard to live with. So the key is to get the prayer life keeping us to remain in a blue zone where I'm not defending me, but we're thinking about how do we do the mission that God has called us to do together most effectively. So I'll stop there and turn it over to my colleagues to set it up. Thanks, Dr. Singleton. And keep all these principles in mind because these play out as we go up from a single congregation out, I'm gonna explore more broadly, conflict within and among Christians. Um, and I wanna give you a, a general guideline, which you may have heard, uh, which can help us, again, analyze what's going on with these things going underneath, but in a broader structural thing. Uh, and this is a guideline that many of you have probably heard. Uh, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Now, this saying has uh, been attributed to lots of people from Augustine and, and John Wesley, but it seems that it emerged out of a particularly terrible time of conflict uh, within and among Christians, which was in the wars of religion in the first half of the 17th century, where people were killing each other uh, throughout Europe over differences, uh, theological and practical. And this was a way to, how, how do we not kill each other? That's less of a problem for us, but it still is a way of guiding us of how do we have appropriate conflict? Because again, as Dr. Singleton said, you read the scriptures, uh, we're both church historians, you read church history, you'll see that conflict has been part of the dynamic uh, of the church. Uh, and so we just need to be prepared for that. So let me uh, unpack that a little bit more fully to understand that guideline and then apply it in a couple local contexts where I have experienced conflict that was uh, not so much within my congregation, but within different circles uh, of other Christians that I was interacting with. So when we say in essentials unity, of course, then the conflict becomes what is essential and what is not essential. And one person's essential thing is another person's non-essential. And, and I would suggest that when we evaluate, you know, what's this conflict about? Is this something essential that we go to what is most foundational for understanding the faith? So as a church historian, I will go to the creeds. So, you know, is this something connected to the Nicene uh, and or the Apostles' Creed. Or as uh, someone who is uh, Protestant uh, and something that we've been reflecting on as a summary, is it some of those solas? Is this about Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, God's glory alone? That's something I would put in the essential. If we're thinking it in terms of ministry evangelism, for example, some of the documents generated by the Lausanne Covenant. Uh, uh, Ultimately, it comes down to me, uh, that affirmation in the Nicene Creed that I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Is this something that is really foundational to that? Uh, is this something that's, uh, if I'm in a conflict, is this putting, put me in greater conflict with the historic church and the global church? And, and sometimes you have a tension with that. Uh, in one of my denominational contexts, 
The more I identify with my denomination, the more I'm in conflict with the global church. Uh, and, and it's working those things out, which are not always easy uh, to discern. I think one of the important things about trying to discern what is essential and what is not essential is to make sure that we don't confuse biblical ends with particular human means to get to those ends. And we often do conflate them. So, uh, and again, this is where I found the global church can help me understand some of the blind spots that we just heard about. Uh, I uh, had the uh, opportunity to be involved in teaching church history to a class that was almost exclusively of Pakistani Christians. And the night we were having class coincided with that morning, there was a military coup in Pakistan, and their democratically elected leader had been overthrown for a general. So I'm thinking this is a justice issue. Uh, and this is a great injustice because, of course, we know that the way you get to justice is through democracy, right? Until I got into class, I'm thinking they're going to be, you know, they're going to be upset. I'm going to have to give them a chance to kind of work through this deep grief that they've had, that this terrible injustice that's happened in their, their country, uh, home country, and with their brothers and sisters back in Pakistan. I came to class, and they were praising God and rejoicing. I'm like... Um, but, you know, justice is democracy, isn't it? And I said, not in, when you're a tiny minority in a Muslim-majority country, then no, democracy is, a, is an instrument of injustice. Mm -hmm. Because no Muslim politician loses any votes by not only allowing persecution of Christians, but even encouraging it. I said, now, we're under new illusions. The generals don't love Christians, but they love order. And so they will stop people who persecute us. And so for us, justice is much more likely to come out of a military dictatorship than a democracy. And I thought, oh, I had conflated biblical and justice with a particular means of getting to it in democracy. So again, it's not always easy to tell what is essential, what is non essential. But in, in, in essentials of unity, these are the issues that we do go to the map for, that we do engage in conflict with, and as responsible shepherds of flocks, we need to do that. In non-essentials, we have liberty. Now, I would say there are kind of two different kinds of non-essentials. One uh, has reformers called adiaphora, things that don't matter. So I would liken that to whether you have a banjo in worship or not. Now, again, you can have great great conflict over that, but it's not something that really matters. A second kind are still important, but they're secondary. That there are issues about which believers in good conscience can disagree uh, that are important. Uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, a Puritan thinker, developed this in a whole theology of the, the nature of denominationalism, but seeing that sometimes those differences can be destructive. Or, I mean, can be destructive, but sometimes they can be constructive. Uh, for example, I've been uh, dear friends for 36 years with uh, my colleague on the faculty, Dr. Scott Gibson, and we disagree about baptism. Now, baptism is an important issue, and we've discussed and, and debated it, and uh, we come to different conclusions about uh, the timing of baptism, sometimes the mode of baptism. We still love each other. We still... Uh, are in fellowship together, but we recognize that we're going to work that out, particularly at a congregational level, in different ways. And, and that simply deciding that we're going to have some issues about which we're going to separate, but not in, call another person a heretic for affirming, is different than being in schism. It's different than dividing the body of Christ. It's doing it in a loving and peaceable uh, and, and respectful way. Uh, so. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, even things that are still important, uh, liberty. Uh, and then in all things, charity. And that even when we are disagreeing about essential things, we want to do so in a loving way, to speak the truth in love as a way of building up the body of Christ. Now, some of the ways that I've tried to work out that guideline in a particular context in a local church setting. I would say one of the biggest places that you have conflict between congregations is through sheep stealing. Uh, 
the church of what's happening now versus old first church. And I stayed in a new church long enough to go from being the church of what's happening now, where people from old first churches were coming to us, to becoming an almost old first church, where our people were going to the new church of what was happening now. Uh, it, it's an inevitable thing. It, it's a really hard thing to deal with as pastors. And sometimes even more, the people within your congregation will get upset about that, and you'll have tension within congregations. Here's where I think we can take initiative to encourage healthy conflict and, and reconciliation, which is as leaders that we're up front about what's going on. So if I had somebody from another congregation who started regularly coming to my church, I would call their pastor and say, hey, I wanted you to know about this. And I had some, though certainly not all pastors, who would do the same. And it's very helpful if you're intentional about praying with the other pastors in your community. Uh, I had a wonderful challenge here this morning in chapel about the importance of hard, serious prayer. And I think part of that is praying with the other leaders in your community. And so I think part of what helped us deal with the fact that we would have people from our congregations who would go was that we were praying together. We were praying for one another. We were praying for our congregations. We were praying for revival and spiritual awakening in our community. It also helped us say, like, oh, uh, the Joneses are coming to your church now. And that's, oh, uh, you had the Joneses too. The Joneses were at our church. And sometimes you... Uh, can be alerted about uh, some rogue sheep who can cause some real problems in your congregation as, <laughs> as well. Uh, but again, the first priority is, again, not how big my congregation is compared to that church or how hot this is or why they shouldn't go that, but saying, how are we going to take care of these sheep? Uh, that we're shepherds of the flock and we want to take care of those. But there will be tension. And sometimes that division does lead to schism. Uh, uh, often I was just, I have some pastors who still consider me a pastor and let me pray with them twice a year and uh, was telling the story of a church in their community where a staff person took a bunch of people out and started a new church and started texting people at the old church during the worship service saying, why are you still there? You should be over here with us. That's a very different kind of conflict. And I think, again, as a separate, you confront that kind of of schism because it does damage to the flock and is dishonoring to the good shepherd. The other primary context where I've experienced conflict within and among Christians has been in a denominational context. Now I know the biggest single category here at Gordon-Conwell is non-denominational, so for some of you this may be less relevant. Uh, but again, I experienced healthy conflict within a denominational setting and I experienced some pretty unhealthy. Uh, healthy conflict had to do when the conflict grew out of personal relationships and an exercise mutually of charity. So a, a big debate in my denomination had to do with same-sex marriage and ordination. We discussed that at our local level where there was a bit debate where I was on one side and a pastor, actually of one of the supporting churches of my new church, uh, was on the opposite side. But we had built a good relationship. Uh, we got together, we prayed together, we mutually supported things within that, but we were able to have good, honest, open debates about what we felt was the teaching of Scripture and the faithful way to go in a way that, again, while we never convinced each other to change our position, did not cause unhealthy conflict between our congregations, which still did some things together, or within our local area. There are times when you may feel in a denominational context that you need to step away personally or with a congregation from a denomination. That's a really difficult uh, decision that should not be taken lightly. Uh, and, and there are some ways to do so, again, peaceably, lovingly, that how you leave is as important as why you leave. And I grieve when sometimes I hear about ways of my fellow alums from this institution have not left in ways that I think left the aroma of Jesus. Uh, we have uh, a couple of my colleagues uh, uh, who are here, uh, Dr. Fissenmeyer and I think Dr. Spencer uh, were here, who I think have done that in their congregational settings in ways that did embody good, healthy conflict and reconciliation. So maybe uh, if you want to hear from them about how to do that. Unhealthily in... Uh, denominational settings I've seen when uh, 
there have been non-relational ecclesiastical power plays where uh, people have uh, done underhanded things to promote their agendas. I saw that as I chaired a committee in our region that uh, was involved in starting new churches and particularly seeing this happen with some of our uh, uh, minority churches. So I mentioned this, you know, there was this Pakistani group that I was teaching that was part of a Pakistani new church and there was tremendous criticism from within our local group because they did not have women elders. Now, nobody went to that church and said, why don't you have women elders? Well, actually, my committee did do that and we knew that. So when they were being criticized on the floor, we said, we asked them this very question and they said, we don't have women elders because first we'd like to teach our women to read. Then we'd like to have women elders once they're able to read. That's a case where if you don't have a relationship, if you're not working things out, again, good goal, uh, wanting to see uh, representational leadership, but not understanding their particular context. Even uh, a more uh, dysfunctional conflict happened uh, when we started a church for uh, Messianic Jews. We had a very public process about how a new church was developed. We followed all those steps. We got all the approvals from everybody. And then after it happened, there was a group that uh, didn't like that decision uh, and so tried to undermine it, not coming to me, even though I had personal relationships with some of the people who did, not coming to our committee to do it, but by introducing a motion in new business at our meeting, which came at the very end of the meeting, where nobody knew what the new business was except the people who were trying to undermine the decision. So at the end of the meeting, when most people had left, uh, they, they tried to do that. And that's where I felt like I needed to be in conflict to stand up for this congregation that had done everything <coughs> right. Uh, that tried it a, a couple other times to do that. They weren't successful. And then I came here, and they were able to pull off uh, that kind of thing. So again, in essentials unity, uh, in non-essentials liberty, uh, in all things charity, and, and one caught a sill from me, and in social media, rarity. <laughs> the place to work out most of the interactions in a constructive way among believers is rarely on Twitter and Facebook. And remember that watchword that whatever you write in an email is public, even if you don't intend it. I'm going to do the opposite as my dear colleagues. I'm going to put my notes in my pocket mm -hmm. so that Professor Singleton doesn't steal them from me. <laughs> <laughs> I have the, the great privilege of spending the majority of my time outside of the church, even though I teach at a seminary and pastor uh, a local church in the Austin neighborhood of Boston. Um, much of my time is spent... Uh, in the streets, not necessarily doing street evangelism, but being amongst the people. Um, as a musician, um, jazz musician, I find myself in interesting places with interesting people. Um, as somebody who does a lot of nonprofit work, um, I find myself in interesting places with interesting people. And the common thing that I hear all the time, and I'll use this old adage as a paraphrase, the old adage says something like this, that the Christian army is the only army that shoots itself while the devil sits over to the side smoking a stogie saying, oh, how they love each other. <laughs> and that's the reality of what I face. Um, whether it's uh, being on NPR every Monday and, and increasingly having to uh, convey a message that not all evangelicals think alike and that not all evangelicals are white, um, or being in various churches and uh, suggesting that there is this understanding of, of free will for some of us and, and that we are sinners saved by grace. But I do believe that in many ways that we, quote unquote, the church with a big C, are supposed to lead society, and yet we defer our authority on a daily basis. We stay out of situations and places where society is looking for our leadership. And then we turn around and we point the finger at society. And so we have a tendency to articulate in our own bubble, in our own spaces, that 
we're at war with culture. Well, we are culture. The majority of society is responding to the things that we do or don't do. And so the tension is, are we the chicken or the egg? The healing piece and the reconciliate, reconciliatorial piece is the fact that we find ourselves in a moment now where conflict, should we choose to accept it and deal with it, can yield great results. But we often choose not to deal with it. There's something about our prayer lives that yield us an opportunity to be so prepared but yet never come off the bench. So some of us are, are content being the sixth person on the basketball team of five people or being that whatever number it is on the football field. And it's almost like you're very prepared. You can shoot, you can do everything that's necessary, but you really don't want to get out there and play. It's almost like being in seminary and it's your last month, right? And you're about to graduate and things may not have worked themselves into place, or you may have a, a job lined up. You may have a ministerial calling, a position lined up, but you almost don't want to leave seminary because there's something extremely comforting here. You know everybody. You know the crevices. You know the challenges. You know that we're flawed people saved by grace. You know that we're messy folks who stumble and fumble and mumble and do all the kind of stuff that we do, but there's a security in that because you know it, and there's a fear of going out and having to actualize and do all the things that you've been prepared to do. And so we think whether it's Joshua and whether it's Timothy, the words that were shared to them, be strong and courageous, or, uh, you know, don't succumb to fear, right? God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power. And we can quote those things, but yet we find ourselves not actualizing them. I think there's a huge sense of conflict internally within us. We know the history of the places that we've come from. We know the tensions that are there, and yet we often become desensitized to them. We have a sensibility of, of what we've been taught and what we've been trained and socialized or acculturated to do, and we very rarely have the sense of the tension of really analyzing that and doing self-reflection or self-assessment on whether we really believe those things or not. I've engaged with a number of people over some things that have happened over the course of the last about 17 months that I've been here, and it's been a phenomenal growing uh, season for me um, because the notion of grace is real, the notion of patience is real. We had a phenomenal um, contact magazine that came out, and I've had great letters from a number of alums going back to you know the late 60s and early 70s. There's one letter that I I think I shared with some of you in my class where a person really tried to articulate to me that uh, Abraham Lincoln was the greatest president because he freed the slaves and, and Jefferson was the greatest president because he, you know, came up with this notion of democracy and even though we haven't gotten it right, we shouldn't throw them under the table. And those thinking, those thought processes are still permeating our land even though we know that uh, Abraham Lincoln in his own words said that he didn't free the slaves because he cared about the slaves. He freed the slaves for a different reason, right? And, and the notion of representative democracy is an aspiration, one that we're still fighting for if we fight. And so the notion is really about what privileges do we have? And notice I haven't said race or ethnicities. I'm talking about personhood. What, 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 what privileges do we have? And, and if we believe theologically that God created humanity to flourish, do we believe that God created humanity to flourish? And that's all humanity, not just the, 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 the enclave where we live, right? If, if we believe that we are to be the salt of the earth, then, then are we really going out and being the salt of the earth? If, if we believe that we have a gospel which we're supposed to preach and share, do we have the patience to actually preach that gospel and share that gospel in hostile places, or do we spend more time stealing sheep? One of the great gifts that I have of being on the radio is people find our church and a lot of people who have sworn off religion. They, they articulate in the old adage that we've heard, and this has been subscribed or ascribed to Martin King uh, when he visited with um, Mahatma Gandhi. And, and the old adage says that Mahatma Gandhi said to him, you know, I don't care for you Christians, but I love your Jesus. And, and, and there are so many people who come into the church and say, you know what, 
I've heard you on the radio, and I appreciate the fact that you don't make me feel bad about who I am, that you don't, uh, uh, you know, beat me up with the Bible, and that you believe what you believe passionately, and you're willing to share that. I just want to come hear more of that. And we've had a number of folks who articulated themselves as atheists who have gone from listening to a sermon and saying, hey, you know, that was a great talk, to saying, pastor, that was a great sermon. And, and, and the goal has never been about trying to convert somebody per se for converting them, but just to share the gospel. And so the point that I'm trying to say to us is that at a certain point, we have to be willing to face the things that we fear. We have to be willing to face the things that cause us great strain and consternation and struggle. And we have to face them in a way where we leave people's dignity intact. Because if you rob somebody of their dignity, they'll never hear you. And if they'll never hear you, they'll never receive the gospel from you. And if they can't hear you and can't receive the gospel from you, then the God that you serve is the God that they will articulate that they will never desire to serve. Uh, lots of um, things to tease out uh, in these uh, comments. Um, uh, as we always say, uh, l let's join the conversation not with a sermon, but with a question, uh, and a brief one, uh, if possible. We've got some microphones around. Uh, uh, this is fair game. Uh, who wants to start the conversation? Let's put up your hand, right? Forgive me, my voice is a little bit weak. <sighs> my question is, uh, with demographics changing in the church, the church is becoming more diverse ethnically. Uh, some of the conflicts we are bound to face are across cultural lines. Uh, so how do we begin to navigate? What are some ways that all three of you uh, would, some advice or wisdom all three of you would give uh, in navigating the waters ahead of us? Good question. Well, the church has always been diverse. I mean, if Todd Johnson was here, he'd tell you that by 923 that there are more Christians in Africa and Asia than in Europe. And so the fact that we don't think that, that, that we assume that the, that the church has always been historically white is, is, is flawed thinking, right? It's not, it's not necessarily based on data and fact. And so the fact that, that the church has inherently otherized people of color by calling them minorities when globally people of color are the majority and domestically by 2040 is projected that people of color will be the majority, so words matter, right? So, so I think the tension is to deal with, as Dr. Singleton talked about, the, the unresolved issues and the, un, the things that we have not dealt with historically and to deal with that, the way that the church has been used right, to oppress people, the way that the Bible has been used, all of those things are redeemable by God. I mean, it, it, all of those things are redeemable. But the question is, are we willing to, to do the hard work and get on our knees and repent and seek forgiveness and, and forgive people's trespasses as we, as we get ours forgiven and debts and all that kind of stuff? But I think the challenge is this. Do we see each other with the, with the lens of Imago Day? And if we can't get there, then we have some eternal work to do. I think one of the things, John, is going to be whether we simply export differences and let different congregations have their ethnic and generational differences and say, well, you're part of the body of Christ, but go have your church over there, or whether we really want to be multicultural and multi-generational, multi-ethnic in one congregation. If that's the aspiration you've got, then it's going to be a long path of understanding and appreciating one another. Um, coming from a denomination that had kind of a colonial history, you know, we wanted multi, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural churches as long as everybody would eventually become like us. <laughs> and, and you know, if we want to have a congregation become part of our congregation that is Spanish speaking, it might be wise to start singing and speaking in Spanish before people arrive so that that bridge can be built ahead of time. 
what I'm watching now among millennial generations is that you, by and large, would rather be in your own generational church uh, and go to a place where you can sing your song and don't have to sing somebody else's song. And my generation is happy to receive you as long as you sing our song. And somehow we've got to learn how to bridge that difference and anticipate a church because when we get to heaven, I think we're all going to be singing a different language than we're singing in now, uh, unless you're Chinese, because I think we'll be singing in Chinese in heaven in Mandarin. So I think we ought need to get ready. I think it does require lots of listening, uh, particularly uh, in context where you've had one group, whether it's generational or cultural, that uh, has been dominant. And that's where you try and tease out the realities that every culture, uh, every generation, every ethnic background has fallen in redeemed characteristics. And I think as we interact together, we help see those. As I said, uh, my Pakistani brothers and sisters helped me to see that the conflation of justice and democracy uh, was a false conflation. Uh, and there been other ways that uh, that happened. I think those who are exercising power need to use that power to give a voice to those who had less power. And that means uh, engaging in some conflict. Uh, uh, so I was willing to go to the mat on behalf of the Pakistani church and say, look, they don't do things the way our church does it. They're not going to. Uh, but they are seeking to be faithful to scripture and do we have room for that? I had to do it with the Messianic congregation and say the policy of this body is that it's a good thing for people, anyone on the face of the earth to become a follower of Jesus in a way that's consistent with our constitution uh, and is faithful to their own unique culture, ethnicity and tradition and unless this body gives me a list of people for whom it's a bad thing to be a follower of Jesus in that way, we're gonna to continue to do that. Uh, so that's, I think, another thing that uh, groups that are in a more dominant position need to use that power sometimes in conflict to create a space that makes it more multicultural. Couple more questions. Uh, this is, I guess, maybe a specific, I'll try to be brief, a specific example for kind of a general question. I have a buddy at home, and uh, uh, we grew up together, and he's come under this uh, way of teaching. Basically, Paul's a heretic. So he's teaching all these people that Paul's a heretic. So I was like, all right, if I was a leader in a church, and there was a person in my church that began to teach the members that, you know, this kind of totally, it just creates a lot of tension in a lot of the gospel narrative and so on. Um, you know, how do you, would you have any recommendations on not necessarily this specific or that specific, but how to be patient with the Lord's process in a person at the same time guarding the flock, shepherding the flock, uh, you know, preventing confusion and, and, and so on. So, how, how do you do church discipline well and how do you do it badly? Yeah, I mean, if he's your, if, <laughs> if he's your buddy, then um, there's a relationship there and I, I would challenge you to engage with him in a long-term conversation um, and, and, and almost to do it weekly and set up a weekly time where you all spend 45 minutes in an hour over X amount of months engaging in fellowship but also talking about that. Um, I, I think that the second part of your question is I think it's beyond your purview to protect the sheep and to protect what they know. And so the question is, at what point, what's the counter narrative that they're being taught and, and, and who's doing the teaching? If he's the pastor of that congregation, then uh, the, hopefully there's accountability system there and there's a board who, you know, whether he's in a denomination, even folks outside of a denomination have an accountability system or structure, right? Um, I'm not sure that you can carry the weight of that on your shoulders is what I'm saying. But I think that in your conversation with him uh, over the course of time, without trying to necessarily sway him to your, uh, the buzzword is agenda, right? But to share with him in, in, in conversation the deliberate notion of what you believe and what he believes and, 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 and to do that dance together. I think the other piece that we always miss, we miss, we, we miss the work of the Holy Spirit 
we try to control the narrative. We try to do all the work by ourselves. We try to protect the sheep. We try to find, strategize, and, and, and do logistics. And we try to put together strategic plans and all that good stuff. And don't get me wrong. It's all good. But leave some work for the Holy Spirit to do, too. Right? I mean, let, let, let the Holy Spirit get in there. And so I, I would argue that, that, that twice the time in prayer than strategizing would be extremely effective mm. in developing a, a, a spiritual protective, you know, field over those folks. Amen. Jesus in the back. Back. Um. So I wanna I wanna hear what was your um, worst conflict and how did you solve it? Because um, I heard. What it, what it is and our goal, but I, I think I rarely heard how to get there. So, for example, Dr. Singleton, how would you um, talk to your senior pastor who made you call to the choir uh, leader <clears throat> and also <laughs> to your uh, associate pastors who was uh, mad at you, for example? <laughs> Yeesh. Um, I, I think... When Dave Curry said, let, you know, charity and all things, I think when you love people, there are steps you can take that mean I don't have to win today. So I knew we were eventually going to get to guitars in church, but I knew that this was a little premature, and I, I like to break the ice and just see what happens, and I saw what happened. And so... The conflict wasn't that big. It was like, do you want to have a job tomorrow? Uh, yes. Well, then call this <laughs> choir director and apologize. <laughs> okay, I get the message. Uh, but eventually, that church has changed. And so over time, they now worship in both styles, and that choir director has now gone to other places. And so I think that part, and this is a personality issue, do I have to win today? Or is there a way to see this solution shining forth another day? So I, I will often just love people to see this process go on another day. Now, with my associate pastors, they did get upset when I would steal their sermons, and they did get kind of flustered. So I would always hide them under the seat in which they were sitting, <laughs> and I would just simply tell them at the last moment when they were in a complete sweat, if you just look right under your bottom, you're going to find it. And sure enough, they would. And so I'd let them have it at the last moment. But I said, you all always be prepared to do improv, spontaneous preaching and be ready. And so... I think I just sort of scared them into it, but loved them every minute of the way. <laughs> loved them, loved them, loved them. Hmm? 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 I think a, a book that uh, a, a lot of my, it was introduced to me by a, a fellow a student, uh, or a person that I mentored uh, who was dealing with a, a very difficult relationship with senior pastors. Uh, and that I found very helpful with our Doctor of Ministry students. It's, it's kind of a little parable. It's called The Three Kings. It's by Gene Edwards, who basically says, we all have this challenge as leaders of either being a, a Saul who looks at everybody younger mm -hmm. as a David who's rebelling, or as an Absalom who looks at everybody older as somebody that needs to be overthrown. And the challenge is to be an idealized David uh, who lives more a life of crucifixion. So I think that's been a good way to kind of reflect mm. on some of those dynamics. I can't share the greatest conflict just because we're recording. I, I don't want it <laughs> on, on recording. But I can tell you that my response and how I dealt with it was through prayer. Um, and if you were in chapel today, uh, Tiffany mm. Lim did a phenomenal um, a, a sermon on, on the power of prayer and, in essence, the importance of it. And, and I will share with you that in certain situations, nothing you do is going to remove the barrier or the burden. But certain things, only through prayer and supplication. And, and I'm a witness of that. Uh, having, I, I receive hate mail all the time. I receive death threats. I mean, it's just interesting. Um, and those things don't bother me. Um, and, and the challenge of them is I've actually learned to respond to them with loving kindness. And so I actually thank people for their hate mail, which is counterintuitive, 
but I absolutely believe that we as leaders of the church need to be leaders. And if I believe of not robbing people of their dignity, mm -hmm. then I think that everybody deserves a response. And so it may be short and sweet. Um, and, and I've learned uh, uh, to, to say what I mean, to mean it the way that I say it. I believe that words matter. I'm a musician, I'm a homiletician, I'm a scholar. So I'm very deliberate with the words that I use. Um, and, and although I tend to be an extroverted introvert, I'm not passive aggressive. And so in that sense, I say what I mean. And, and that's been helpful um, because in situations where there's a miscalculation or a misunderstanding of personality or whatnot, the, I believe that words matter, right? And so, it, so I don't cut my words. Uh, when I'm on the radio, I, I don't cut my words. Um, and I, 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 I measure them, but by my own scale. And so I think that prayer actually resolves things. There's certain things that are happening right now that, that, that prayer has actually resolved them. Um, and so that's kind of, kind of how I go about that and what I do. And let me give you th six words, June, that, that 1729 Presbyterians came up with these, that when you're in a conflict, and if for some reason you lose in that conflict, then the six words either actively concur and say, okay, we'll go with it, or passively submit, meaning, ooh, that's not what I voted for, but okay, we're going to have to do it, or peaceably withdraw. And those have been helpful to me in all kinds of conflicts. Can I actively concur even though I didn't vote for it? Can I passively submit? Or do I need to peaceably withdraw? And sometimes in conflicts, I've made all three of those choices, depending on the situation. Let's have one more question, and then we'll bring it to a close. In the middle. Hi. I'm wondering what you, the three of you, think the church's role is in addressing social tension, political tension, especially when people in your congregation are coming from many different points of view and experiences? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I say that without jest, yes. I mean, the fact that we have to ask the question demands an answer, and the answer is yes. Y yes, the church has a role. The church is, 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 in essence, in existence to play that role, right? And so I think that one of the challenges that we have is that sometimes we're, uh, I'm, I love adages and one-liners, right? So sometimes we're so heavenly bound that we're no earthly good, right? Everybody's trying to get to heaven, but, but it's everyone trying to get to heaven and not worried about who's on your left and who's on your right. And, and I think we deem ourselves, and, and you know, I, I'm not going to be in conflict with what Dr. Singleton just said, but I think sometimes we have to speak. And I think silence is not an option. Um, and, and, and there are so many things that are happening today, whether it's you know, sexual harassment and sexual assault, whether it's you know, a discrimina discrimination or prejudice, whether it's just obscene you know, lack of morals and ethics. I think that's a place for the church to speak. I think people who hurt people tend to be in people's churches. And, and I think that's a place to speak. People who are prejudiced and racist and discriminatory tend to be in people's churches. People who, who, who are harassers and assaulters tend to be in people's churches. And so, so, yes, the church must speak. The church must have a prophetic voice in these spaces, and the church must intervene in these spaces. And I think the church must hold people accountable in these spaces. And I just said on the radio on Monday, I think, I think, this is me, I think that folks who are in Congress who have these accusations uh, to them Sure, they should go to the ethics board and, and all that kind of stuff, but I think they should remove themselves, right? I don't think that we need to worry about who gets to vote and the numbers and all that kind of stuff. I mean, if we're leaving a better world and a better country for our children, then we cannot let the moral values and the ethics of what we believe diminish because of a vote. I mean, what does that say to your children in terms of how 
civics and, and, and civil discourse and the importance of being a good citizen and a good uh, uh, you know, church polity if you want to take it to the church, we're setting a horrible example, right? a horrible example. So the answer is yes, there's an absolute role for the church to be a part of the conversation, to intervene, and I would also argue to lead it. I think if we want to be blessed, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and so that's very much at the heart of what it means to uh, be the people of God uh, today. Uh, there are challenges to be able to work that out in controversial things, and that's where I think, for example, say the work of Ken Sandy uh, and the work of peacemakers can help equip us to make sure that it doesn't exacerbate the conflict in unhealthy ways, but help people explore, again, what's essential, what's not essential, how we hold up a biblical end. Can we disagree with the means? Is it every means possible the way we're seeing, say, for example, uh, in Congress or what? I think we have to say no. Are, can Christians disagree in good conscience about one means of getting to this end and another means of getting to this end, neither of which are inherently uh, immoral? I think they could, and hopefully we can do it in a way that uh, upholds the name of God and lets the spirit of God work and ferment to bring us to positions that none of us came in with or would have thought of apart from that conflict. And I think that the church needs to always speak, and I think we need to cautiously think about how. Um, there are some issues that, are, that need to be discussed in a context where we can hear both sides I think one of the temptations for us as preachers is to assume that we can speak into something, and there are times we can and must, but it's a monologue. And so when we speak into a situation as a monologue, we better really be sure we've got the mind of Christ on this one, uh, because what people often object to is that the pastors use the pulpit for other means. And I think we just need to think, how can we frame a discussion so we can bring the facts to bear and have everything brought to discussion? I'm, I, I would be pretty um, against uh, the proliferation of guns in our country. I think this is a tremendously awful idea, and yet it would be, behoove me not to be just the voice as the preacher about that, because there are lots of Christians who are carrying guns in worship, as we're there. Um, and you go, I'm shocked to discover that. But in my previous congregation, I found out, okay, this is not as simple as I thought it was. So maybe we need to have a discussion about this rather than just preaching about it. I still think there's no reason to have these guns in church. But I've got some people who said, but we're here to protect you. Oh, well, that's not a bad idea. Okay. But. <laughs> uh, this has been, uh, I hope, a, one piece of the formation process that seminary is to be about. Uh, learning how to bump into each other uh, and bumping into how we bump into each other. Uh, uh, this is, in one sense, a safer environment, but we hope it's not too safe. Uh, and we hope that the conversations, not only in a place like this, but uh, in the hallways, in the apartments, uh, in the classroom, uh, and in chapel, uh, make us a little uncomfortable. Uh, uh, that there is a sense in which God speaks into our lives uh, in conflict. Uh, not only to solve it, to resolve it, but to recognize our own role in it.